Today's webinar is a part of a series of webinars we do throughout the year to help keep professionals in the solar energy, uh, energy storage, and grid modernization markets stay informed through research and analysis on the latest technologies and market trends. Today's presentation, Solar Field of Dreams, Tracking Your Solar O&M Investment, is brought to you by our partners at Next Tracker. My name is Cedric Bleu, Executive Consultant at Soleil Chamba, and I will be moderating today's webinar on behalf of GTM Research. I have been a close partner of GTM Research for several years, and I'm the author of several of their reports, including one called Megawatt Scale PV O&M and Asset Management. Since today's topic revolves around O&M, I'll be moderating the discussion. As you know, Green Tech Media uh, delivers business-to-business -business news, market analysis, and conferences in, that inform and connect players in the global clean energy market. Green Tech Media's coverage extends across the clean energy industry with a focus on solar power and the electric utility market's evolution. GTM Research is the market analysis and consulting arm of Green Tech Media. You can stay informed by reading the news on greentechmedia.com and find out more about market research products by visiting gtmresearch.com. Here are our speakers, but before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to go over the screen in front of you. You'll notice several widgets at the bottom of the screen that may be of interest to you during today's webinar. The green folder con contains a link to download a copy of the slides for today's webinar. So you will get the slides, you just need to download them. You can also share this webinar through your preferred social media channels by clicking on the share widget. Speaker bios are accessible from the blue widget next to the GTM logo. And more importantly, please note that the Q&A module on the left side of the screen um, is, is available for, to you at any time during today's presentation. You can submit your questions for our speakers, and we will be answering questions throughout the presentation today, as well as at the end, uh, when we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. Back to our speakers, we have a great lineup uh, today. We'll be hearing from Marty Rogers, a Vice President of Global Asset Management and Support at Next Tracker. Jason Smith, President and Chief Operating Officer at Calcom Solar, Scott Canada, Vice President of Renewable Energy at McCarthy Building Companies, and Eris Polychronopoulos, General Manager at Biosar. And with that, let's dive into today's topic. I will start by sharing some market statistics and landscape information from GTM Research. Uh, starting with the tracker market. Um, installations grew um, grew very steeply in 2000, from 2015 to 2016, and are, con are expected to continue to grow, although at a slightly slower pace um, moving forward. Uh, and part of that is is that we saw a lot of large sites being built in 2016, and we'll continue to see very large sites as as the as the uh, utility segment continues to uh, to pick up. Very interesting slide on the U.S. Um, as you can see, uh, the share of, uh, of trackers as a percentage of ground mount systems is pretty impressive uh, in this market. And you can see it uh, climbing from 2015 to 2016 to a level exceeding 70%, uh, 72%. Uh, percent. And it's expected to uh, plateau a little bit in 2017 and 2018 simply because um, there were a lot of very large systems built during this uh, amount of time. So we'll just have to uh, give a little time for things to settle as, as the, the bump of installations of 2016 and 2017 uh, gets uh, uh, behind us and, and, and we get back into a more normal growth pattern. Uh, but growth is expected to uh, resume after that, and the market share is expected to resume uh, increasing as well for trackers, uh, largely driven, of course, by the utility segment. If we look at system pricing, um, there's definitely uh, been uh, price declines, and even throughout 2016, between the first half and the second half, um, a, a strong decline, and even more so if you look at the year-over-year uh, -year, uh, pricing for a single access tracking utility system, um, GTM Research uh, estimates that there's about a 20% year-over-year um, drop and that the uh, system prices will continue to fall uh, to, uh, by almost 40% by 2021, which is pretty steep. A 
Let's take a look now at the market landscape. Uh, there's a lot of players in this space, and, and this chart show, shows us um, how the market is organized. On the, uh, on, uh, the column, uh, you can see that there's different designs, dual access versus centralized trackers or decentralized trackers. And then the lines in this table show us the types of companies that are active there. Uh, you have vertically integrated firms that have trackers, such as Empower um, and First Solar. You have diversified manufacturers that also do trackers, mounting structure companies that uh, that do have trackers as well. This is the most crowded space. And then pure play tracker vendors, uh, that is definitely a shorter list. Um, and, um, and as you can see, our, our friends at Next Tracker that sponsored this, uh, this webinar and will be with us today uh, are in a bit of a unique spot with a, with a decentralized tracker design uh, and being a pure play tracker vendor. This webinar is about ONM, so let's talk now about the, the high-level impact of trackers on PV system ONM. And this is just focused on ONM, not the overall equation. Uh, uh, from a maintenance perspective, uh, trackers uh, do bring higher costs uh, when you look at it from a dollars per megawatt per year, uh, simply because there's more components and uh, these components move. So that means more maintenance and it means more failure points as well. This is, this is logical. Uh, but it's important to note that um, O&M costs are usually budgeted and tracked in dollars per megawatt per year, uh, which is why uh, we see an increase in, in the cost based on trackers. If it were calculated in dollars per megawatt hour, it would be, however, a different equation. Um, trackers also come with increased complexity of performance analytics um, and issue detection and availability calculations simply because, for example, how do you, how do you calculate availability if uh, your system is still producing but your tracker is not quite pointing in the right direction? So you have a loss but you're not, your system is not completely off. Um, it's, it's, it's a little complicated. Issue detection can be complicated for the same reason as well. If a tracker is completely not tracking, you will be able to see that. But if it's not quite tracking right, it can be uh, subtle. And, and the performance associated can be, uh, um, the performance drop can be hard to detect. And, and I'm sure Marty will, will tell us a little bit about the advanced analytics that we can have that, that resolve these issues. Um, and there's also a vendor risk. Uh, if you add more vendors to the picture, you add more risk. And so trackers are an additional component that is critical to the system once they're installed. And so you're now dependent on the vendor or their supply chain in order to uh, be able to maintain and continue the supply parts throughout the life of the plant. Uh, on the flip side, there's a few clear benefits from trackers when it comes to system O&M. For example, um, you can you can stow the trackers and uh, allow better access for vehicles between rows, uh, whether it's for cleaning or for mowing, uh, as long as you know the tracker design allows that. Allows that. That's not the case for all trackers. Um, and um, the stow mode uh, can also help prevent or reduce system damage when you have uh, extreme weather events like high winds or hail or other scenarios that I'm sure some of our speakers can uh, can tell us about some of some of the horror stories that um, that uh, happen in the field and that you can you can use some special functions of trackers to mitigate. Uh, for more information on this topic, there's a number of PTM reports you can you can uh, consult. One of them is, is called the Global PV Tracker Landscape 2016, so very specific to this topic. And then more about the O&M topic, there's the Megawatt Scale PV O&M and Asset Management Report. And for uh, especially for uh, webinar attendees today, you get a 20% a 10% discount uh, using the code uh, Webinar when you make your purchase. And also, uh, one final note before I turn it over to Marty from Next Tracker. Uh, GTM Research is offering today's webinar attendees a special discount, discount code to uh, the Green Tech Media Conference. Uh, there's two events, the Solar Summit um, and the S3 Solar Software Summit, uh, both uh, co-located in, in Scottsdale, Arizona in May. Uh, don't miss the opportunity to take a, a deeper dive into the industry and, and to do some uh, networking with key decision makers in the industry as well. And you can use a discount code again, 15% uh, applicable to both events. But enough about discount codes. Uh, let's uh, turn to Marty from Next Tracker, who will provide some insight about single axis trackers, uh, how they impact maintenance costs, and how to optimize the value throughout the life of the plant. Okay. Thanks, Cedric. This is Marty. I want to thank uh, GTM, obviously, for he helping us put this together, but also uh, Jason, Scott, and Aris that are on the call with us. 
Uh, we're going to talk uh, just briefly here about uh, Flex. So let me get the slide up. There we go. Uh, so uh, Next Tracker is actually a California-based manufacturer of highly innovative and cost-effective PV independent solar tracking systems. We were acquired in September of 2015 by Flextronics, which is now known as Flex. Uh, Flex is about a $26 billion company with 200,000 employees worldwide, and it's been in business since 1969. So I, I bring that up because it also strengthens our position where we stand right now. Uh, Next Track has been in business for about four years. Uh, Flex has been in business since 1969, but we're a full subsidiary of Flex right now. Uh, we have about seven gigawatt of trackers that have been sold. Uh, we're the number one tracker supplier worldwide. We can produce about 150 megawatt of trackers per week. And to add to that, we're in about eight countries on five different continents. I want to talk a little bit about the idea of tracking versus non-tracking. You know, the concept here is, first off, obviously working on higher yield. Uh, reducing, you know, with a reduced cost of the tracker that Cedric had talked about, obviously your costs come down on the system. Uh, easier, planable O&M. Uh, again, when we talk about fixed trackers versus, or fixed systems versus trackers, Cedric mentioned that there is a difference in O&M, and we want to be clear that there is. Uh, but we think that, obviously, the overall higher production is a, a bigger benefit for the customer. And finally, the concept that with trackers and with specific systems, like the next tracker system you have, the capability for remote monitoring. Sorry, the next slide is taking a bit of time, but uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, successful O&M planning when it comes to trackers. Let me let me advance that again and see what happens. There we go. Uh, so. Basically, why independent versus a link system? So I want to be clear, there's a lot of different types of trackers, and Cedric had shown the chart of different tracker manufacturers. We're going to focus on independent versus linked. In an independent system, obviously, you get a different layouts and flexibility on your uh, optimization of your land. Uh, it gives you more PV to install, so it improves your density. It's easier access between the rows, so you can, it's easier to clean and do your vegetation management, so it reduces your overall O&M cost. And I would say that you can obviously uh, move the tracker system, not, not move the tracker system, but design the tracker system to improve your O&M as you move forward. Finally, uh, when we talk about O&M, you know, we, we should talk about things like what happens on a project when we install the project and how does that work in our advantage? So I've been in O&M for about 15 years. I will tell you that one of the key things in O&M is to have the right partner from the day that you start the installation process. So that you're thinking not only about the cost of the project, but obviously the cost of long-term O&M. Uh, you know, when we talk about things like land management and vegetation management, these are big costs within the O&M budget, and we're going to talk about the cost in a minute. Uh, but module cleaning, all these things as we have to go in and around uh, trackers, obviously improves or increases the cost. If we had a free road through the trackers, we reduce our cost. The other idea between a link system and an independent system to think about is uh, the, the financial cost if the system does not track. So if you lose one tracker with, uh, you know, 80 modules on it versus a link row system where you lose all the modules for production, uh, there's a big financial cost that you should be thinking about as you move forward on these. And when you do the monitoring, you get this concept of predictive maintenance, right? So the idea of talking around predictive and proactive maintenance and targeting where your maintenance goes is also a way to increase your uh, utilization, increase your performance. Finally, when we think about parts and availability, and I've been in the uh, solar industry for about eight years, parts and availability is a huge issue, right? So when we talk about things like warranty, warranty is really great so long as you have a strong enough company behind the warranty, as long as they have the balance sheet that's there that you need. The issue of parts has to be something along the lines of, I don't want to go store parts for 10 years and then take a 10-year-old part off my shelf to go use it. I want to have readily available parts, and I need to know that my partner is going to be there to do that. Uh, with Next Tracker, we offer a 10-5 warranty, 10 years on the structure and five years on the controlling parts. Uh, that's extendable, so you can get a different warranty if you want and increase it. Uh, but, but it's interesting, I think, when we think about warranty, we take for granted that the warranty is there and therefore it's valid. 
Um, I, I think we all know from the solar industry that a valid warranty is only as valid as the company that stands behind it. So I want to talk a little bit about the economics of the warranty or economics of the tracker system. Uh, do all, you know, when you have a single axis tracker, you know, the question is, can I achieve a uh, lower LCOE overall? Sorry, my slide is not moving as fast as it was. There we go. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of assumptions that are in this chart that we have here. As you can see, uh, we have this chart laid out, so it's about a 100 megawatt system, and we planned for about four cleanings per year with two vegetation management events. So the LCOE for the 100 megawatt project of fixed versus tracker, we clearly know that there is a cost for O&M. Uh, our estimate is that cost is about 3%. Uh, we are the largest installed tracker base, so we're pretty comfortable with that cost. Uh, but obviously 3% is a fairly nominal number over the total budget for the tracker economics. The increase in production that comes from a tracker is approximately 20%. Now, obviously, this depends on where you are in your site and everything else. But 20% production minus your 3% increase in your O&M budget uh, gives you a net gain of 17% of additional production. So I would also say that active monitoring of the system, and Cedric talks about a couple of issues like weather, hail, rain, uh, winds, things that you got to watch for. Active monitoring of the system allows you to manage that as well. And on top of that, I, it, it will help you increase your overall productivity. It will reduce your cost of O&M because you know exactly where you need to go and for what reason, and it will allow you to improve your utilization again. I want to talk about this picture just a little bit uh, on the next slide as it comes up. So we're going to talk about the specific O&M considerations, and I think this is a great picture to highlight O&M considerations. Uh, this is not a field that was supposed to be flooded. Uh, this is a field that, you know, in California in recent months had a, obviously a flooding issue. So it wasn't part of the plan, right? I, I think it's important for us to understand when we're purchasing a tracker, uh, whether we're a developer or an owner or an O&M firm, you know, that the product cost is one thing. It's important, obviously. But the real important part comes from the quality, the reliability, the third-party testing that's been done. If the supplier doesn't meet those qualifications, it doesn't make sense, in my opinion, to go partner with them on something that's going to last 25 or 30 years. The parts program should be simplified. Uh, you know, you should have somebody that has the financial backing. You should be thinking ahead about – they should be thinking ahead about their evolution and sharing it with you. So if your company that you're working with decides they're going to go change uh, 10 different things on the tracking system, that means that typically the parts are not reverse compatible. I think it's important for anybody that's in the O&M side and an owner side that the parts are reverse compatible so as generations move forward, you know, you're not just participating in it, you actually know that you're secure in getting a part in the future. Uh, this is a big issue for, you know, things like uh, uh, the inverter part of the market, right? So we don't want to stock a bunch of parts that, you know, are going to have a shelf life and we don't want to be out of parts in five or ten years because the manufacturer decided not to manufacture it anymore. Different types of O&M considerations that I like to think about is one is you know, certainly routine, things like panel cleaning, vegetation management. You know, these are all tied together in the system. We all know that we have to do them. What we should be looking at, you know, in our case, the independent versus the, versus the length roll, uh, it reduces your routine maintenance. It reduces the cost. If you're not driving in and back out of, a, of an aisle, obviously your utilization is higher, your efficiency is higher. Uh, the next one is conditional. You know, talking about uh, proper system and monitoring maintenance, you know, if, if in fact you have a live monitoring on your system uh, feeding back into a group that's watching that system, and we talk about this in the industry obviously as well, uh, it's imperative that we get that data and that we have an activity that we can move from the data. Understanding that time-based maintenance is not necessarily the most efficient. In other words, doing something every January 1st because it's in the schedule doesn't mean it needs to be done January 1st. Uh, using conditional maintenance, which uh, it links back to your uh, system, can tell you when you actually have to go do that maintenance and not just force it out. The other side of it is thinking about pre preventative versus corrective. So we all know that there's preventative maintenance. You know, we want to we want to go tighten bolts. We want to think about you know the uh, uh, different situations where we can prevent the uh, unit from facing any damage from a wind or a hailstorm. These are preventative cases, right? 
uh, but the built-in monitoring, once again, helps you kind of prevent those things from uh, becoming, well, let's say, overwhelming, right? It tells you when something is going wrong so that you don't wait for the failure. Uh, corrective maintenance is all about that unexpected repair and replacement, right? Things that we, can, we, we, we can't feel like we can't analyze, but uh, I would say that with a, a system that is actually monitoring it, like the next tracker system, not only can you monitor, monitor it, you can analyze it and you can make your corrective action either remotely or by you know, focusing your team in the area where there's an issue and making sure that they're the most effective when they hit it. And the final part I want to talk about in knowing and considerations is the site and the component level, right? So when we think about the site level, obviously this slide is pretty clear. Uh, the site was not supposed to be a floodplain. Uh, it turned into a floodplain. And what can happen when that, when that goes on is obviously if you have equipment that is under the water, uh, whether it's a motor or a controller or cabling or gearboxes or anything, obviously they're susceptible. And the dollars that sit on this, you know, are kind of unknown, right? We, don't, we, we can't plan for something like that to happen necessarily in this case, uh, but we can plan to work with the right partner that helps us for it. And finally, on the component side, you know, it's all about how replaceable, how quick can they get in, how quick can they change something out, do they have to, uh, you know, kind of manage it differently than other, other things. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, the concept of rising above. Uh, in the concept of rising above, we're talking about planning for, you know, long-term programs, long-term maintenance, long-term reliability, and keeping your system above ground level. You know, different systems obviously mount things at different areas. Uh, with the unlinked system, the independent, uh, everything is mounted up higher. The, the uh, uh, I would say the things that make sense when you do that are that you're not running the risk of uh, flooding, contamination, damage by a machine, or, you know, creating a harsher repair environment for your technical team. Talked a little bit about the uh, concept of no obstruction. So the next slide is going to give us a, a diagram around the no obstruction, but it creates a clear O&M time-saving advantage. It's the heart of an independent tracking system versus a uh, linked row system. Uh, you can move the panels on the next tracker system both to face each other so you can improve your cleaning uh, and, again, reduce your time on the site. It gives you a smoother workflow without repeating the steps, uh, moving around ground objects or thinking about things that you, you know, could damage that are on the, that are on the uh, ground. Another big concept, uh, one that, you know, uh, Next Tracker is really kind of very strong on is this idea of swaged versus uh, torque, and, uh, torque uh, fittings, right? So first off, I think we mentioned it before that we have 85% less fasteners and we use the swaged connection. Uh, the swaged connection obviously has a big difference from a torque connection. Anybody that's been in the field knows that you know, when you're in the field, you have contaminants, you have rust, you have lubricant problems, bolt fit, washers, temperature, surface conditions, and obviously you have the whole concept of humans versus machines, right? So uh, team fatigue, pace of the operation, uh, lack of scrutiny, you know, going back and not, not just, you know, the first step, which is to insert the bolt, tighten the bolt, and use a wrench, but then to go back and actually uh, create the torque value for the bolt. Uh, the next concept around the torquing is that if you have a torque pattern, it means that your team has to actually follow that pattern. Each time they follow it, it takes about three times, the 30%, 70%, and 100% to finally get the actual pattern uh, torque that they need. And finally, you know, the whole concept of lubricants in the field, uh, we know that if you do lubricate the bolt in the field uh, and you're using a torque connection, chances are you're picking up contamination on it. Uh, I would also say that with the next tracker system, with the swage uh, system, you really you use a tool to do it. So it is an automated process. It's guaranteed every time when you do it. And it's not a new technology, right? This has been around for trains and planes and uh, all kinds of uh, movable objects for years. Talk a little bit about the digital O&M. So I think in almost every slide we alluded to the concept around the digital O&M and what it does for the business. Uh, this is something that uh, Next Tracker is a pioneer in right now. Uh, obviously, there's other systems that you know can monitor, uh, but from a tracker point of view, uh, this is probably the most uh, intense system that's out there. So how does it help you with uh, monitoring, or I should say, how does monitoring help you reduce your O&M costs and practices over time? 
You know, the concept here is that if I can use a digital system to manually control my rows and understand exactly what they're doing, uh, track production of individual rows, understand weather patterns and analyze them prior to the need for a stow position, uh, create this whole concept of face-to-face -face planning so I reduce my or improve my utilization. Uh, you know, I know exactly what parts are doing what throughout the system. For instance, on our system, we have a 24-volt, 1.5-amp uh, motor on each one of the systems, but it's a balanced system, so it's a really low draw, and we can see in our monitoring system if that draw starts to come up and, and become higher. Uh, obviously, we have event recording, so we know exactly what happened if there is an event. Uh, you know, did the wind pick up? Uh, did something happen on the site? Did the, uh, did the inverter shut off or comm shut off? Uh, watching things like current draw tells us, you know, uh, for us it tells us how, how, how healthy our battery is, how healthy our motor is, how healthy our sluger is. So all these things reduce the cost and all these things can be automated and put into your system. Uh, finally, you know, it allows you to consolidate your roles, which is important from an O&M perspective, right? And we want to improve our efficiency. The way we improve our efficiency is by when we go to a site, we know exactly what we're going to do. Uh, but with using the digital O&M program, not only do you know what to do, you know where to do it, and you also have the idea of, you know, if there's a failure next to it or three rows down uh, that hasn't shown itself up because the current has gone up on the motor draw, uh, we would dispatch the team to go do the motor at the same time. Finally, I think we want to talk about the whole concept of O&M and the partnership and kind of planning for life. These are 25-year-plus projects. Uh, you've got to get the right product uh, from the right partner. Uh, you've got to plan for the maintenance. You've got to understand the real value of the warranty. You've got to understand that, you know, torquing is not a long-term fix. It's a, it's a long-term threat. Uh, and finally, you've got to make sure you get the right training and support. Uh, I would put as a last note, there's a white paper available on all this on both the uh, Next Tracker uh, website under resources and under the GTM website. So with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Calcom Solar uh, with Jason. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate the introduction. Thank you for, for the detailed review of, of Next Tracker. Um, my name is Jason Smith. As, as I was introduced, I'm the President and Chief Operating Officer of Calcom Solar. We've been in business for about four and a half years. We're comprised of a lot of industry veterans, anywhere between 10, 12, 14 years of experience within the solar uh, and energy industry. Last year, in 2016, we were ranked by Inc. 500 as the third fastest growing privately held company, number one in the energy sector. We, uh, we're very happy for that success. We have no investors, and we have bootstrapped our business to the extent that, that we, uh, we have no investors. Um, to that end, um, I think one of the things that we want to share is, if that's who we are, what is it that we do? Uh, we, um, we do everything from development of projects, we acquire projects, uh, we originate projects, and we also perform our own EPC. 95% uh, of the work that we, we do, we self-perform. We own our own equipment. We install uh, the next tracker, various trackers, fixed tilt, um, roof mounts, and, and also carports. Um, one of the things that, that we do also is we have a system performance group. When we do the asset management, we do the operations and maintenance, we do warranty insurance claims, and, and engineering services specific for those asset management uh, moments. You know, what, one of the things that, that I'd like to highlight is, is being able to be a part of the entire, um, the entire chain from development of a project all the way through the managing the asset provides us a unique perspective. That, that, that I think provides uh, or sort of leads into a, a philosophical approach that we have to the way that we execute our work. And I'd like to suggest that there's a, a paradigm shift that we should have within the industry and that we should acknowledge the fact that, that most of the clients for us, whether we're co-developing, developing, selling a project or otherwise, 
they're not as interested in our wonderful construction project as they are uh, their return on their investment, the long-term reliability of the project, uh, the highest uh, technology uptime, and also the, the highest production that it can yield. Most of this is because they would like to have uh, some sort of sense of reliability and predictability of their investment and expected return. And, and if that's the case, they're, they're interested in the construction portion only to the extent that they're going to receive the highest quality of workmanship and installation of the pieces that have been chosen, the partners, the technology. Um, and, and if we've already acknowledged the fact that uh, the juice is worth a squeeze when comparing both the fixed tilt as well as the single axis tracker, that the economics pencil out for the single axis tracker, then we're left with only one question, that is the level of comfort individuals have during this operations phase or the O&M phase. And I, the one, one part of the philosophy that we approach is that it, it's not a matter of if the system will encounter a failure, it's when. And for all the reasons that Martin described, choosing that partner becomes incredibly important. And one of the things that you can highlight here on this is a truck just sitting there. If we can plan for the end in mind, by choosing the right technical part, technological partners, the right suppliers, and design all of our systems, then we should be able to either avoid a truck roll or have planned truck rolls so that they're the most optimal when they do roll. And if that's the case, then choosing those partners and those design systems are incredibly important. The as you can see, next tracker, if you think about the choosing of a partner, it becomes incredibly important when we start talking about this. So for us, the way that we try to plan for the end in mind is we leverage what we have as a remote operations center. We design everything at the very beginning of the development of a project, the preliminary design and so forth, understanding that the partners we're choosing have all of the correct communication protocols. We design in-field hardware networking so that we can get all of the data that was suggested by Next Tracker into our dashboards so that we can not just monitor the system, but we can remotely control, operate, and diagnose the issues that are at hand so that we can make those key decisions on when to roll a truck or if to roll a truck or to leverage the relationships that you have and the partners that you choose to participate in those remote diagnostics. Having independent roads versus uh, a single drive line lends the opportunity for one to avoid rolling or avoid, uh, I should say, major failures. Being able to have that remote control ability provides you the opportunity to be able to see exactly what's going on on, on the site. If you see um, if you see some of the the ways that we've been able to to leverage from the pictures that we've had here, you can see that that partnership is incredibly important in being able to provide the owners of the asset that op, that that reliability and that comfort for uh, the return on their investment. I think in in closing, I think it allows um, I think it allows being able to choose those partners, um, whether it be an inverter manufacturer who's participating and not all do with remote diagnostics or your single axis tracker manufacturer, having those inputs to be able to understand what's going on on the job site, remotely control it and make those key operational decisions either in behalf of or with your, your asset owner gives you the control to be able to maintain and predict the cost during the O&M phase. I think I'd like to turn that over now to McCarthy. Thanks. Um, Thanks. Hello, my name is, uh, is Scott Canada, and I'm the Vice President of Renewables at McCarthy Building Companies. Um, we're we're U.S.-based. Uh, EPC of utility scale projects, um, primarily work in the in, here in the in the U.S. 
And I would say 90% of our work is, is really with single access trackers. Um, before joining McCarthy in 2010, my role was, um, I worked at Arizona Public Service and in, in one of my major roles was kind of a tracker development, deployment and maintenance. This was uh, very early on when, when trackers were, were still being kind of kind of checked out and determined whether they could truly perform and add the, uh, add the value and we could bring the cost down. So it's been an interesting view of the evolution of what's happened with trackers. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on single axis trackers and talk about the two different types. Um, that's kind of a gained tracker, kind of the, the ATI type approach and, and kind of compare and contrast with the uh, with with the single tracker row, more like the next tracker. Um, so so as I was thinking through the history of these, um, kind of over the, the past 16, 18 years, it's been an interesting evolution. The, the world of single axis trackers started out primarily with a single drive, single row tracker, relatively low reliability and high cost around the trackers and drives and the controls. Then we we transitioned to the gang tracker because we could we could kind of spread the high cost of, uh, of improved drives and controls over many more megawatts. And now we're, we're evolving back um, to some degree to a single tracker row. And, and a lot of that is really driven by an improvement in the reliability and controls of, uh, of the distributed drives and, and really helping uh, level the cost out. So, so now we have choice between the two different options. Um, mm -hmm. Looking kind of at, at, the two different types of trackers, in our mind, we, we tend to break these down into two different buckets, and one's reliability or production versus O&M cost. And it's, um, it's just important to note that, that those play into each other, but just from a uh, trying, to, trying to determine which path a, a developer or an owner wants to take forward, it tends to make the conversation a little easier for us to, to place it in those two buckets. Um, as we're we're driving through many of these um, many of these decisions and working with owners and then looking at our own warranty cost and supporting our owners longer term um, from an O and M perspective, uh, we're seeing very or relatively little difference between the single row drives and the gang trackers. And and what we're we're finding is you know both provide a, a certain amount of benefit. Um, from the large gang trackers, you have a, uh, a single drive, you have a, uh, a, a single point of failure for, for likely 20 to 30 rows worth of tracker, and you can invest a little more and you have few, fewer moving parts within that tracker. The downside is, obviously, when one goes down, you lose more. And so on, on the flip side, the, the single row tracker, you obviously have a smaller impact when you have a failure, but you have a handful of more failure modes. And so really we find that, that that choice is not, the reliability from an energy perspective doesn't swing significantly either way. Uh, however, you, you may find that the O&M approach really is driven more by the plant size, the location, and, and your general approach to O&M. Um, so maybe the punchline to, for, from a reliability perspective is we're finding the capital cost on the overall plant is still driving the decision more than reliability. Um, with this said, we do believe there's a handful of, um, of, of uh, cost items and risk items that um, really we ask our, our owners to consider and our owners often enough ask us to help, help them work through. And so we place those in really three categories. Um, one of them is, let's say, a significant damage event. The second would be uh, systemic um, O&M or quality concerns. And then the third would be kind of the accessibility and some of the things Martin had spoke to. And, and really all three of those should be considered, but every project has its various drivers. So um, from a, a significant damage event, we're seeing that the industry is evolving very quickly. Um, everybody who's, who's on this call, I'm sure, is experiencing this. But there, um, we're seeing a lot of cost pressures and evolution and designs changing very quickly. And what we see is that there is um, a speed to market where you have additional, let's say, wind or seismic risk in, in these projects. And if you have one of these events, which um, McCarthy has experienced, a design error in, within the traffic or within the tracker can bring a, bring a project down for a decent window of time. 
even if insurance is helping you solve the problem, it's a uh, it's a pretty big drain on on revenue as well as it'll it'll distract your management and other team from uh, focusing on going out and getting new work or optimizing the plant that you own. So, from our perspective, this is an important place for uh, for for owners to to hold their EPCs accountable. From a McCarthy's perspective, we um, we do full peer reviews using uh, insurance structural engineers to walk through the entire design anytime there's been a major change as well as the install manuals and start helping us identify where those risk points will be and where those failure points will be and working hand in hand with our suppliers to help drive out those those risks. Um, Next Tracker has been a great partner on that front. Not that they've had had a design issue, but have been a great partner with working with us to try to work. Um, through any concerns our owners and or um, our peer engineers have had. Um, the second category, what we see, and, and Martin spoke to this, that we see is is a, a noticeable cost component that we haven't, I, I don't think most trackers have experienced, but will be in the next five years, is a general retorquing, well, we'll call them systematic O&M, Kind of either driven by quality from install and or just design. So retorquing of of all the bolts and nuts, um, checking all the grounds. We've had experience with wrong hardware being shipped and any number of kind of challenges that could drive overtime, um, kind of a loosening up of the tracker. And this is a very high maintenance cost item that we don't believe you can really work away from without design changes on the front end and, and improved quality from the contractor. To go through and retorque the entire system is just a very labor-intensive component, and it's going to cost a great deal of money, regardless of uh, of, of kind of your best plan, best laid plans. Every hand has to touch every nut and bolt. So we we've, we've worked uh, repeatedly in in kind of two areas to try to drive these costs out. Um, Martin mentioned the uh, the huck bolt approach that they have they have uh, implemented that helps design out a problem. Um, it does take some time for our teams to learn how to uh, how to maintain and 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 operate the hug guns and kind of make sure the quality is there on the front end. But once it's installed, it's pretty well in, it's it's pretty well maintenance free from a uh, from a bolt loosening perspective. Um, we also see pre assembly coming out of the uh, the manufacturers, and this really helps drive out some of the field labor, which is. Uh, which is inherently more prone to having uh, having quality issues. And the last, we've we we find that implementing a very stringent QC process, and this includes mock-ups, first install, approval by all manufacturers, training through within our our company is called training within industries. We're implementing, but there's any number of very clear training programs when you're bringing unskilled labor onto a project site that you need to implement. And then a very structured audit program around how those installations are going. And um, I would just encourage every owner in, in this uh, on this call to um, to take the time to challenge your EPC and suppliers to have a very clearly articulated plan around how they're going to focus on reducing uh, reducing these quality risk and and future cost on your project. And the last was was access that Martin had mentioned. Um, from our perspective, the inspection of the system is not quite the access um, concern as, uh, as, as maybe um, dealing with vegetation management. So we do see a significant change in those costs on, the, uh, on, on vegetation management. That's not going to impact folks in the western arid U.S. Um, however, it is a higher impact on the east. And then. Um, Last, I think uh, really starting to adjust and grow your um, your O&M plans and discipline about how trucks roll and when they do and what you're rolling for can vary significantly between these two different types of designs. And um, I would just uh, encourage uh, encourage every owner to, to take a deep dive into that. Your, your EPC partner will have some opinions, but um, there are operations experts out there who, who uh, could really help bolster your program. And uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to uh, to Eris and uh, let him take over from here. So, hello, and my name is uh, Aris Polifonopoulos, and uh, I'm a general manager of uh, Biosar. <coughs> Biosar is an EPC contractor on, uh, for solar PV plants, uh, mainly active in uh, Europe and Latin America. 
So we've installed around 1.2 gigawatts, mainly in Europe and Latin America. Uh, we do mostly EPC. We undertake maintenance activities, but uh, actually mostly we do the first two years under the warranty period to ensure performance guarantees. And usually we're not perform operation maintenance for long term. So we've commissioned plants with uh, single axis trackers uh, and uh, a few in uh, with uh, most, I would say most of them with next tracker. We've commissioned in Chile, US, uh, and uh, Greece, and uh, right now we have under construction two projects with next tracker. It's 250 megawatt in uh, Brazil, 191, and uh, another 50 megawatt in, in Brazil. So as an EPC contractor, we see a clear trend on uh, single axis trackers. And uh, we see that uh, even, I mean, it's, uh, we see that worldwide there is a request for all longitude and latitudes in the world, it's a request for uh, single exit trackers. Um, so usually it's uh, more than 20%, but uh, due to the capex of uh, single exit tracker, now we can uh, apply and uh, next tracker is applicable to most places in the world that can have more than 15% yield with respect to fixed yield applications. Uh, so we see that, uh, so um, let's say differently to what is, was expected, uh, we offer, let's say, operation maintenance on single axis tracker at the same price as fixed yield based on megawatt, installed megawatt peak. Uh, so that's also our personal view that uh, single axis tracker, especially the next tracker configuration, does not increase the OPEX of the, of the project. It may vary depending on the tracker manufacturer, but we do believe that we can maintain the OPEX the same. The CAPEX is, let's say, around 10% more with uh, single axis tracker applications, but actually the yield is 15, 20, or 25% depending on location. So it's, it's very clear that uh, all around the world there is a clear advantage of uh, LCOE. So the cost of electricity is much lower when you apply um, single axis trackers. So, and it's, there's some kind of proportionality, I would say. So, it's uh, depending on the on the more yields with single leg tracker, you have more better LCOE for for the application. Uh, regarding the operation maintenance, uh, I have uh, I have listed a couple of considerations for the OPEX of the project. So, I would focus on on configuration of uh, next tracker. So I would say the benefits of next tracker with respect to other manufacturers and other configurations of uh, single axis tracker. So I would say that, um, so I would, I'm trying to say the advantages and uh, I'm trying to, let's say, promote single axis trackers and uh, let's say, uh, give arguments that they do not have uh, uh, higher OPEX than uh, fixed sales applications. So we have one portrait, single axis trackers. So modules are within reach of hands and uh, on clear sight. So it means either washing, inspection, and testing. A clear structure below the modules and key accessibility, better, easy, easier moving, weak control, less damages. During night mode at high tilt angle possible, so it means less oiling. So depending on if you're doing projects in deserts or in other places, or high tilt angle, with uh, you have snow discharge in other places of the world. So I mean that uh, depending on your application, your the location of the project, there are different benefits of single X tracker and uh, with, uh, let's say, I would underline the configuration of X tracker. So the bearings are maintenance free, the, the movement is very slow. So we do not consider that this is, uh, this is, let's say, increasing the OPEX. So despite the moving parts, I would say movements are very slow, so we don't anticipate a higher OPEX costs, and uh, slew drives are very racked, uh, movement is very slow as well. So I don't think that, at least in our perspective, we don't see any issues with respect to higher OPEX due to the moving parts. So the conclusion for the, for the operation of the, of the OPEX, it surely depends on the location if it's, uh, and uh, the conditions, the, let's say the um, wind loads, uh, uh, snow loads, or the desert environment soiling. So it clearly depends on the OPEX, but I wouldn't say that the OPEX of a single latent tractor is higher than uh, fixed. Uh, with next type configuration, I do believe that it's the opposite, but uh, due to, let's say, the lack of data and experience, uh, this needs to be proven if lower OPEX can be achieved with next tracker. And uh, to, let's say we need some years with data in order to see 
uh, the percentage that we can achieve lower OPEX in extra K configurations. Uh, so thanks a lot, and let's move to Cedric for, let's say, a Q&A session. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, heads up to the audience. Uh, we have lots of excellent questions, and we're going to go um, start answering these and go probably past the uh, the end of the hour. So stay tuned. And if you have more questions, you can still submit them. We're, we're going to process as many as we can within reasonable time. Um, so first question is, is for Next Tracker. Does Next Tracker offer full system O&M or just tracker maintenance and support? So uh, Next Tracker has just uh, tracker maintenance and support uh, through our communication center. Yeah, obviously, we have uh, field teams that if they're commissioning and need support and training, we also do that. But uh, with our system, we don't currently see any need to have a full maintenance team for the tracker. Uh, but for the future, there's always the concept of creating a whole maintenance team around the solar field. I something interesting to look at. Thank you. Um, and um, next question, how do you monitor the subtle tracking behavior in individual rows? So we Marty, have inclinometers well? on, Yeah, we have inclinometers on each of the trackers. Uh, they're recording back to the uh, control unit and to the ultimate control system. So we can monitor any changes or differenti differentiation, I would say, between different rows. Uh, it's also something interesting for the future where we think there's a concept around increasing production by being able to do subtle movements with individual rows that you couldn't do with a linked row system. Interesting. Uh, so a question I think brought for the broader panel here, could, uh, could you walk us through expected O&M costs throughout the life of a project for a single access tracker? I, I believe, Marty, you had a slide for this, but the question is maybe a little, diving a little deeper into the, into the numbers and maybe getting feedback from, from other, other panelists as well. Yeah. So, um, We'll put up that slide so we can kind of talk about it a little bit more. Um, you know, yeah. the way that we took it is we took a total maintenance for the 100 megawatt field, uh, which came up to about 645,000. Uh, you know, in that we just pulled out the differentiation between a with a, with a tractor system versus a fixed, and, and added that to it. Right, so that's the three percent that you get. Um, we, we definitely, you know, we still think that there's a visual inspection that needs to be done, uh, functional testing needs to be done, uh, drive set system inspection, I, I think that's an interesting one because we've talked about that, right? So obviously we have a, a drive on each one of these, uh, but they are all non, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 they're non-maintainable. There's nothing to do with them. They're sealed. Um, so the brushless motors is uh, a part of it, so that's a very long life. Uh, the sealed slew gear is very long life, and the, uh, the controller that we have is now a, a sealed controller as well. So very low maintenance. Uh, definitely there is on both systems, whether you have a linked or an unlinked row, there's some form of battery backup. Uh, batteries are going to tend not to last for 40 years or 30 years, so we know that. Uh, so we left, yeah. obviously, that in. It doesn't matter which way you go on the system. And actually, we have another question about battery life. So can, can you tell us what the expected battery life is for the battery component? Sure. So the uh, battery life is, uh, you know, it, it, it's obviously a function of how often the battery is used. In our uh, Generation 2 controller, the battery is actually a backup, so the functional life of the battery is extended pretty dramatically. Uh, to say that it's you know well beyond 10 years, I think is is fair, uh, because again, the way you measure the life of a battery is by the number of complete discharges and recharges that it makes. So if you're powering that off of a solar panel and not using it as your motor driver, then that battery cycles are much lower. So going beyond 10 years, I think, is uh, very, 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 uh, uh, very probable. Um, you know, you always could have issues with a battery here or there. I don't deny that. I don't think anybody will, whether it's a centralized GPS or not. Uh, but these are maintenance-free batteries, and with the Gen 2 controller, they are 
easily change it out, and they're fairly standardized battery. And uh, talking yeah. about uh, no, of some not. of these components, yep, go ahead. I was just going to say I wouldn't mind adding something to the ONUM cost of a tracker, I think. This is Jason from Calcom. We, we now have about 40 megawatts worth of the next tracker of in the, that represent about 50 projects underneath our asset management operations and maintenance. And we bring, like, there's, there's one piece of the next tracker um, that, that I think that is, is understated, and that is the ability to bring in all of the data from each one of the self-controlled uh, tracker um, units. We can bring in and we can see the battery life. We can see the sun position. We should see each one of the rows tracker positions. And that gives you a level of understanding when you start thinking about setting up set points and alarms and maintaining up time or some sort of contractual obligations you may have for any one of those things. The ability to be able to make and see, make decisions based on what you can see is really the way that you can control costs. Each one of those arms may represent a very small portion of the overall cost of a project. So when you look at what you may potentially be losing by having one arm that may not be functioning versus a single uh, drive that may control 500 kW, it, it, it makes making a decision to roll a truck very different. And that's sort of the philosophical approach that I was saying, that, we, that, that having independent rows and bringing all the data in makes um, decreasing O&M costs on the back side during the operating mission phase much, much easier to manage. I would also say that, you know, Cedric, uh, part of what you said about the tracker cost going down, uh, the anticipation is as we get, right now we have about 29% of our fleet or more uh, that is reporting in. Uh, we are uh, finalizing our NERC SIP compliance, which allows us to go to much larger sites to do the monitoring on them. Uh, so that should increase, obviously, the coverage that we have. But the overall O&M cost also needs to find a way to reduce over time, right? So uh, cost of labor is never going to go down. It's going to go up. But how do you reduce the number of calls and reduce the number of instances that you've got to do a direct roll? Uh, through this system that, you know, Jason was talking about it, they decide when to roll. If one system is down, that's not necessarily something they roll for. Uh, but if they have a couple different things that are showing up in the queue for the uh, monitoring, uh, now you have a reason to roll, and you can go do that roll and do it economically. So I think it will overall reduce the cost by 20, 25%. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and if we um, continue on that topic of, of um, O&M and, and the life of the different components, um, we have a question here about the life of uh, switch fasteners. Um, how long do these last in your experience? So, you know, a switch fastener has a, a, a life of the life of the project. So if you have a 30 or 40 year project, uh, the switch fastener does not loosen. Um, it is a, uh, made of a component that it will not rust. Uh, so, you know, the end result is so long as you're maintaining your system, uh, making sure that, you know, you're not having other issues by running into it or something, I guess, uh, the switch component has no finite life. It is matched to the system life, and the system is steel. Yep, thank you. So let, I have a question here um, from someone wanting to uh, learn about cleaning robots and how they uh, how they fit in the picture, how they impact the um, how they impact the the O and M, but also how they work with um, with a tracker system. Is that something you can talk to um, Marty or, or or one of the other panelists? Yeah, I mean we, we have a couple things, right? First off, the concept that uh, you know, that we have the inward-facing rows for cleaning, I, I think is quite unique and, and very helpful. Now, that doesn't answer the question of automation, but it does answer the question of how do you reduce your cost on cleaning, right? Uh, when we right. talk about automation, you know, there's a couple guys out there that are building the robots that are going across the system. Obviously, if they have to jump across the gap, that would be uh, problematic. Uh, so we are working with a couple of those companies and trying to figure out what the best way to design either uh, you know, the robotic means to cross the gap, or how do we, you know, kind of close the gap down that makes sense for the robot itself. 
so there's new technology, I think, that's coming out, and we're working on some of that, uh, that would allow you to, you know, ultimately be able to use some kind of robotic cleaner. It's not there today. Got it. Question for Procalcon, um, and I think that you do perform O&M on, on, is it on the tracking system or do you do, do the overall solar PV uh, system O&M? And I think I'd like to ask the same question to our other panelists as well so that each can get a, gets a chance to, to clarify what scope of O&M they do. Uh, yes, thank you. We, we, we perform, perform asset management operations and, and maintenance on the entire solar system not just the tracking system, everything. What about you, Scott? Um, so McCarthy performs O&M on a handful of projects. Um, the vast majority, we, we take more of an O&M, or sorry, a, a warranty role. We stay involved for, for typically the first two to five years. Um, but outside of that, it's not our, our core business. Understood. What about Biosart? The same. We perform uh, O&M activities for two to five years. It's not our core business. Uh, our background is electrical engineering, so we, uh, we uh, let's say, after commissioning, we perform all the uh, O&M activities for the whole plant, including inverters and all the electrical and electronic components of the PV plant. So it's not only the tracker. I confirm. Understood. And um, one more question here that we're we're getting a number of questions on on what what fails. So I'd like to uh, to elevate that into a broader question. Uh, we got really good info from Marty on on how battery life is pretty long, and some of the switch fasteners they they're designed to last as long as the plant. But so practically speaking, what is it that breaks? Well, uh, look. You know, this is an O&M conversation, so we all know that something is going to break sometime. That's, that's life. That's what we deal with. That's what any O&M guy deals with, right? Um, I would say that most people in the solar industry are fairly new uh, about telling you what could break or what should break. Certainly, we know that the ultimate is that the battery is a replaceable part. It, has, it will at some time need to be replaced. So I would say that's, you know, the one that you would think about the most. Uh, when we think about uh, the drive, for instance, it's sealed. Uh, it's under virtually no load at all, so it shouldn't be and is not currently a failure mechanism that we are concerned with. Uh, the motor, again, with the brushless motor, again, I'm, I'm not concerned. I think a lot of times if we are helping people to understand the installation practice, uh, we can avoid project pro problems with projects, you know, like working with uh, Calcom and Biosar and uh, McCarthy, uh, working with them up front to make sure that their techs understand that, you know, when they open a box, they close the box and seal the box. When they put in cables, they're not drawing on those cables and pulling. So I think those are things that could help out in the field. But certainly from, you know, what is the most critical part that fails today, uh, we don't have a, a slew of anything, but I would say that the battery will be obviously something that you should plan for in your own M, and it should be a budgeted item, not, it shouldn't be an exception, right? This, that makes sense. Thank, mm. thank you, Marty. This is, this is Scott Canada. I could probably add a couple of points, um, but we see at least in the first year, there's often enough some, some common communication issues, and, and that can be as much from the install as, as it is from the, uh, from, from you know, any components actually in the tracker and this is kind of broadly speaking, um, that tends to be a headache point. And then we, we've seen on a, a handful of trackers that, um, that the dampeners will fail on, on just a select few. Uh, once those are replaced, they're, they're typically more uh, kind of initial install type issues, and then, then things tend to operate very smoothly, as, as Martin outlined. Perfect. 
Well, I think we we answered as many questions as we could handle without getting taking too much time. I'm sure all of our speakers could speak about this for for a lot longer. Uh, but we're going to wrap it up for today. I want to take this opportunity to uh, to thank every every one of our speakers uh, and for you in the uh, in the audience. If you have additional questions, some of these questions, every question you asked has been logged, so you may receive an individual response if we're not able to address it on the call. And feel free to also reach out to Next Tracker uh, for for any. Further questions, as well as uh, as the other companies that presented from Calcom to McCarthy Building and and Myosar as well. Thank you, everyone, um, and I hope everyone enjoys their day. Uh, this webcast will also be available as a recording, and uh, the slides are available for download too. Thank you again.